pleased to introduce, although I think most everybody here knows Brother Paul Vaughn already. We're pleased to have him and his good wife here with us this week. Paul was born in Maysville, Kentucky. Been married to the former Ricky Jett for 35 years. He said it wouldn't last. Okay. He attended Maysville Community College, Lexington Technical Institute, 1986 graduate, East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions. He's worked in various mission works and, and uh, has a, uh, a reputation for being able to start work from, from scratch, and he's currently in the Hallsville, Kentucky area, and uh, that started in the year 2000, and uh, they now have about 50 folks there, so that's testament to his good work. Debater, publisher, editor, and so on, and writer, and uh, we're just pleased to have him speak to us, and his topic is the Bible, inspired by man or God. Paul, come enlighten us. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And I know last year I came down with pneumonia, and, and we had actually were in the car, we're on our way, and I was looking a little worse than usual. And my wife said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I feel a little bad. And she said, she does, we do carry a thermometer in the car, and she took my temperature and said, well, we better just get you to the doctor. But we made it this time, and I'm thankful. Thankful for those 35 years, Brother Ross. Now back home in Kentucky, when young people get married, they put them on the calendar. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that down here in, in Texas or not, but they put them on the calendar to see when that first baby comes. <laughs> well, my wife and I, we don't have any children, so I'm assuming we're still on the calendar back home in Kentucky. That's from the time when I used to have party lines and they would talk to us. So those folks get married, you just better mark that one on your calendar. I really appreciate Brother and Sister Litke and their kindness in putting us up and being so kind to us and so thankful for that. They're an encouragement to us. Open your Bibles if you would. By the way, I want to hear pages turning. We're going to be talking about the Bible from God or men. I think we'd better be turning some pages and looking at it, hadn't we? Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. I want to start off in reading a passage from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth that teaches us a tremendous lesson and hopefully we can draw a conclusion to it show you that the Bible was written, did come from God. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 3, in verse 15, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now this is a powerful verse. When you think about all the things that took place in Corinth and, and Paul's letter to them, and, and he rebuked them for their partisanism, for following preachers instead of following God, for saying, I am of Paul or I am of Cephas, instead of saying, I'm just simply a Christian and following Christ. And he gets over here and he says, no other foundation. When we think about that, no other foundation. When we think about that passage, that means that there cannot be another foundation possible in which we are building on but Jesus Christ. No other foundation cannot be another foundation that all of Christianity is summed up in Christ Jesus. Everything that we do here, the sum total, everything is summed up in Christ. In fact, if you remove Jesus, because there's no other foundation, if you remove Jesus, then the church crumbles. As anything that is without a foundation will fall. Now that means that we cannot alter the foundation. 
We cannot change the foundation in any way. We cannot replace the foundation for no other foundation. You say, well, what does that have to do with the Bible being inspired by God or man? Because everything we know about Jesus Christ comes from the Scriptures. Oh, I know there's been thousands of books written about the Lord, but if it wasn't for the Scriptures, none of those books would have been written. If we take the Scriptures and we look at our Lord and we look at Him in prophecy, someone's coming, we look at Him as coming in the Gospel, and we look at the letters that He's coming for judgment, thus the question put forth, the Bible, inspired by man or God? Well, it's inspired by God. It's God's book. All we have to do is to look at the evidence if we believe in looking at evidence. I know last night that wonderful lesson that was given on Christian evidences on, on that uh, little machine. That was a powerful lesson. That was the evidence that was presented. Well, we have evidence here. And all we have to do is to look at the evidence and draw the conclusion that that evidence demands. That it comes from God. Well, you see, it is God's book. It is true. John chapter 8 and verse 32, that, that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I'm looking at Brother Denham's manuscript that he's going to be giving later on this week, and he did a, a wonderful job on truth. Without the Scriptures, there would be no truth because everything would be subjective up to each individual and what they feel and what they believe. That truth is absolute because I guarantee you man would not think of truth be thinking up some type of lie to propagate on someone. Sanctify them by thy word, thy word is truth. John chapter 17 and verse 17, you shall know the truth, well where's the truth? Well it is God's word. It's the scriptures. And not only is the truth God's word, but brethren, Christians must be prepared to defend the Bible. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Put on the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil. If we look at society today and they make fun of the scriptures, they put down the Bible and they put down the people who believe in the Bible. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart that someone would be so arrogant to put down something that they've not even looked at to examine the evidence. Because I don't see how an honest person, how an honest person could look at the evidence and reject the Bible as coming from God. And I didn't do that. <laughs> we'll learn. We'll see if we can go through this. Well, the Bible is verbally plenary and sparse. That is, every word is there because God wants it there. Every word is there because God inspired the writers to put it there. The Apostle Paul said this in first or Second Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen when he says, All scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. All scriptures are God breathed. They come from God to the penman. Now were the penman uh uh Writing as, as a rope secretary would or a secretary or a someone trans, uh, uh, giving uh, a, a secretary a note and they're writing down? No. For if you look at the scriptures, you have the individual style of the writers. You can tell the, the writings from Paul, from, from Peter, because their style is, is different. But it still came from God. It was literally God breathed. Now turn your Bibles with me if you would. Well, let's go over here to 2 Peter in chapter 2 or chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. 
It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. simply means that the Scriptures were not made up by the individuals. The Scriptures were not made up by those. When Moses was writing, he didn't sit down and he said, well, I think I'll write something fanciful for the people. No, he wrote as he was inspired by God. It says, prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When we think about the scriptures, that the scriptures come from divine origin. In fact, the writers of the Bible did not have the authority to establish doctrine. That's already established. If you look at Psalm 119 and verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And it's going to remain same. The writers of scriptures, they didn't establish anything, for they wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, doctrine's established, so it's in the poet. This is the doctrine that we follow. This is the doctrine that we teach. And if we don't abide in the doctrine, we have not God and we have not Christ. The only way to have God and you only have Christ is to abide in the doctrine, Second John verse 9. But it was established in heaven, according to the Scriptures. In fact, many things change us. Just in our recent history, in our lives, there's been so many changes. And I was teasing about being on the calendar back home because we found out the sun got on the calendar through the party line. Now we got cell phones and all kinds of inventions. All those things change. But you know, the Word of God doesn't change. For the Lord said through Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. It's going to stand. It doesn't change. It is God's word. It is his word for us to follow. Now, there are so many people that, that throw doubt on this because simply they don't want to acknowledge God because that means they'd have to do something about it in their lives. So if they say, well, you know, we don't know anything about the Bible, it's just a bunch of people, they wrote things down, they wrote it from different prejudices and things like that, and so we don't need to follow it. But if they admitted that it was God's book and it was verbally preliminary inspired, then they'd have to follow it. And yet that's what they're teaching. Now the Bible claims inspiration. If we look at the Scriptures, the Old Testament... Thus saith the Lord is used 420 times in the Scriptures. In other words, if you want to start in Genesis and, and you want to go through Malachi in the Old Testament, 420 times the writer says, Thus saith the Lord. And then the Lord spoke is used 136 times in the Old Testament. The Lord said is used 217 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have the, the same thing being done here. The Lord said as you 17 times, it is written 61 times. The word of the Lord is used 261 times. We must be people of the book. And we must be, as thus saith the Lord, preachers and teachers and writers. I have a weekly newspaper article. In my article, every time I want to make sure it is written and then I'll quote scriptures. Because I want those people to know that this is not something that comes from me, that this is God's word that I'm quoting. And they can look at the scriptures and they can look it up if they don't want to, to see where I cut and pasted it in the article and they can see that it comes from the scriptures, that it's not from me. We need to be people of the book. And the reason why I think some people are in the, some are in the church today are not people of the book because they haven't had a thus saith the Lord or it is written proclaimed to them for a long time. They settled for entertainment. They settled to, to have their backs patted on. But we must not settle for anything else. 
But thus saith the Lord, if we're going to be pleasing to God, if we're going to do what is pleasing to Him, we must know what He says, and thus we must have, thus saith the Lord, preaching and teaching. There are over 2,500 phrases or claims that, that is attributed to the Bible to God. Through the scriptures, 2,500, over 2,500 that attributes the Bible from God. Now, as we look at the Bible claims inspiration, let's look and see what the Bible says in the case of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, in chapter 1, Jeremiah is a young man. He tries to get out of his responsibility to, to proclaim God's word. That's not going to, God's not going to let him get by with that. And then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Therefore, when Jeremiah was speaking, it was the Lord's words. Now, it got him in trouble with the people. It got him put into a, 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 a cistern, and he sank down into the mire. The king didn't like it. But God did. God did. Because he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. And thus, he was giving the people God's word. David lived a thousand years before Christ. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. David is saying, when I'm speaking the scriptures here, when I'm writing the scriptures, it is God's word. It's not my word. And then in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, so a man of God could be complete in his knowledge of math. Oh. So a man could be complete in his knowledge of history? No. So the man could be complete in his knowledge of geography? No. So a man can be complete in his knowledge of God. So that we can know what to do in our daily lives. Without this book, I dare say, a lot of more meanness would be in our society. Without this book, in this country today, the divorce rate would probably be double what it is. Without this book in our society today, homosexuality would have already been triumphing a lot more than what it's doing. But the thing is, the only way to defeat that wickedness is to take God's word and say, here it is. And let's look at the evidence. Now, Jesus' view of the Bible. I, I never, it seems as though to me there are a lot of people that say they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the Bible. They say, well, give me Christ and don't give me the book. Well, you can't separate the two. Or they say, well, give me Christ and don't give me the church. You cannot separate the two. For you see, when we look at Jesus, Jesus, one cannot believe in Jesus and reject the inspiration of the Bible. You cannot say that, that you believe in Jesus and say that this book did not come from God. The Lord viewed the Old Testament as fact. The Old Testament is fact. He regarded the record of Jonah as history. Now in our lesson this morning, the, the, uh, I believe it was Michael, uh, address this as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days so the son of man will be in the heart of the earth three days now you're trying to tell me that, that the Lord actually believed the story of Jonah yes and if you don't believe in the story of Jonah then you don't believe in Jesus you don't believe his teaching you don't believe in what he says because so you cannot separate him from his belief in the scriptures not only that, he regarded the record of Adam and Eve as history. Now open your Bibles. Now, I know Brother Broking last night did a very excellent lesson on 
marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I'm not going to try to rehash his lesson because I couldn't improve upon it. But the fact is, if we look here in Matthew chapter 19 and starting with verse 4, and he answered and said to them, well, they were trying to come and, 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 and say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus said, have you not read that he who... What's that next word? What's that next? Someone turn the phone off so I can hear it. Hey, okay. Better. We'll get y'all awake one way or the other. Next time I ask what that's next word, flip that camera around and see who's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now this is the Lord's commentary on Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. In the beginning, God created man and woman. And if you want to see the more detailed account of it, you go to Genesis chapter 2, how he made man and how he made Eve, and how he joined them together. And he meant them to stay together. I know I said I wouldn't do it, but I'm going to have to do it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What God has put together, let not man separate. Except Matthew 19, 9. Matthew 19. But the fact is, the Lord looked at these, just look at his teaching. He believed in the record of Jonah. He believed that Adam and Eve were created just as it is set forth in the Scriptures. Now let's look at the scientific foreknowledge establishing the Bible is from God. The Bible is not a science book. It was not given to us as a science book. The Bible is a book to guide man, man in spiritual matters. The, book, the Bible is a book to guide us so that we can spend eternity with God. But yet, when the Bible speaks scientifically, it is correct. Thus, scientific foreknowledge of the Bible is evidence that the Bible comes from God. Isaiah spoke of the circle of the earth in Isaiah 42, uh, 40 and verse 22. Now, how did Isaiah know that the earth was circular? And he lived over 700 years before Christ. He hit in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They thought that you was, the earth was flat and he'd just go out and fall off the edge of the earth. Well, no, Isaiah knew that the circle was, the earth was circular. Well, how did he know that? Did he get up into a spaceship and fly up to the moon and walk around and look back? Hey, that thing is a circular. It's not flat. No, God inspired him to write those words. God inspired him 700 years before the Lord was born to write those words. David spoke of the path of the sea in Psalm 8 and verse 8. Now, how did David know that? We didn't discover it until this is the past few hundred years ourselves. There are certain sea lanes that if you start here in the United States and you, there are certain sea lanes you can get into and you can get over to Europe a whole lot quicker and there are certain sea lanes that come in the opposite direction you get into those and it saves energy. You get in and it helps you get along a little quicker. Why, well, a thousand years before Jesus was born. A thousand years before Jesus was born, David spoke that. And then Job, in Job 20, uh, 38, verse 16, speaks of the springs in the seas. He's talking about springs in the sea, freshwater springs in the sea. And, and guess what? I was watching, and I don't usually watch the Discovery Channel. I don't like to have my mind indoctrinated with the hedonism, because generally they try to teach evolution on the History Channel, but I just happened to be perusing the, with the channel shifter. I like this, you know. You men can get into this, can't you? And I think I fell asleep and I had my hand on the clicker and when I woke up it was on that and they was talking about the springs in the sea and they even sent divers down and filming freshwater springs coming up from the bottom of the ocean. 
Well, how do you suppose Job knew that? Now, I think everybody would agree that Job lived before Jonah. Someone could ask him, you know, Jonah, did you see anything besides that whale's belly when you were down there? No. Jonah couldn't have told him. Well, did he get into a uh, diving bell and, and, and jump overboard and, and dive down to the bottom and see these freshwater springs? No, they didn't do such things. Didn't have submarines. But yet, Job wrote it. He was inspired by God. And this information is there. All we have to do is to look at the evidence. Now, let's look at Solomon's statement in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 5, where Solomon says, The sun rises and the sun sets. And modernists say, hey, that's evidence that the Bible doesn't come from God because we know that the sun doesn't rise and the sun doesn't set. The sun is stationary. The earth rotates around the sun on its axis, and as it rotates on its axis, you can see part of it's going to be facing towards the sun and part of it's going to be facing towards the earth, towards the, towards the space and darkness at all times. Thus, contradiction of error. Anybody of any scientific mind would not could see that that is error. Really? Well, first, Ecclesiastes is poetry. We allow our poets certain elbow room when it comes to writing, don't we? But you know, from man's point of view, the sun rises and the sun sets. And he wasn't trying to give us a scientific explanation. But besides that, we have scientists every day use that same terminology. And you'll see it yourself if you watch the weather tonight. Or you watch your weather in the morning, and they're going to say, well, the sun rises at 6 o'clock, and the sun sets at, at, at 7.42. And they're scientists, aren't they? Meteorologists. They use that same terminology, so that doesn't really, that doesn't float, does it? If that be the case, then why don't they call the meteorologists ignorant and backwards because they use that terminology too? But from man's point of view, it does rise and set, does it? Now, not every Bible comes from God. We need to be aware of this. Go back to our passage here in 1 Corinthians. For no other foundation can any one lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. He is the foundation, but the foundation that we build upon is the gospel, isn't it? We preach Jesus from the Word of God. We preach Jesus from the Scriptures, if we're going to be gospel preachers, if we're going to glorify God. And if the Scriptures are perverted, then you can be very sincere in your preaching. You can be very zealous in your study, and you can still be lost. Because not every book that calls itself the Bible comes from God. There are dangerous Bibles out there, and I know most of you are quite aware of this, but I want to bring it to our attention again. The Bible is from God, but dishonest man has deformed the shape of truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. But they can reshape things any way they want to do it. Because they go to the Scriptures, and they read in their bias, they read in their tradition, and translate those things into a Bible. There are two ways men have twisted the Scriptures. The mistranslation of God's word. If you look at the Jehovah Witnesses and their doctrine, they do not believe that Jesus is eternal, that he is God. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, which if you take your Bible, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In their Bible, the New World Translation says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They just slip in the little article A in there, and that makes him, when you realize, they're not a created being because they don't believe in the eternality of Christ. So they just translate their doctrine, their era, into the Scriptures. Well, the NIV 
which is one of the most used among a lot of members of the church today, is nothing but permeated with poison. If you follow that Bible, you cannot go to heaven because you're not going to be abiding in the doctrine of Christ. You're going to teach that men are, are born as sinners. You're going to teach that we have a sinful nature. You're going, to, you're going to teach that once saved, always saved. And you know, you can just about tell what Bible people are reading from, from what they say. And if you're praying... God guide us today and mean it in a, in a spiritual way separate and apart from the Scriptures, then you've been reading a mistranslation. A mistranslation will cost you your soul. We first moved to Hallsville. I talked to Michael about this a few years ago. That there was a lot of folks there that had the NIV translation. We started with 12. Well, what do you do? Do you just jump on it all at once, get out there and think, that thing is no good? And then they will not listen to me and they'll go somewhere else. And they're not going to be saved. They're not going to know the truth. But in the third week, I said, do you know the errors that are in that Bible? No. Well, you don't mind if I show you, do you? Oh, go ahead. Well, I worked up a list on it. Showing the errors of the NIV, and I preached it. Well, that changed some, but it didn't change others. So every time we'd have a Bible class, and I knew where <laughs> that rascal was mistranslated, I asked one of them that had it to translate it, to read it. And they would read it, and I said, Now, do you believe that? Yeah. Now, now are you sure? Let's see what it says. For you see... That is a mistranslation. It took me two years, but they all put that thing away. Sometimes we need to be a little patient with people as they learn. They need to change because they see the evidence from God's Word, because, not because some man told them to. Not be patient with sin, no. But allow people time to grow. And if they're honest... If they're honest, they'll change. If they're not honest, there's nothing to do about it anyway. But the mistranslation of God's Word. Well, notes and study Bibles is another dangerous thing. You can take them, and, and, and the bad part, there are a lot in the church that likes to use these Schofield study Bibles. I tell you, if you use that and you look at the notes, you'll not go to heaven. <laughs> All you have to do is look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. When Peter gives them the plan of salvation, he says, Repent, and everyone to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And in the notes, well, this does not mean for the remission of sins. Well, what does it mean? Well, it means you're already saved. That's the study Bible notes. Now, this is my opinion on study Bibles. Will you agree with me or not? That's incidental. The study Bibles came about because people are just too lazy to study the Bible for themselves. They're too honorary to sit down for a few hours each day and open God's Word and get a Bible dictionary and yes, get some good commentaries and study and make their own notes. So they think they can get a study Bible, go into Bible class and act like they know everything because they can read a few things out of the bottom of the page. And those things aren't from God and they can cost people their soul. The times are dangerous, and we must be wise. We must be wise when it comes to the Bibles we use. Well, the Bible is not a book to be offered. I don't have any liberties at all to change one A or one jot or one tittle in this book. It's God's Word. You ever have someone twist your words? About every one of us have in here or, or attribute something to you that you never taught or never thought. You didn't like it, did you? You know, God doesn't like it when we mess with his words. We're going to look at that a little more in a second here. 
it is not an amulet or a charm to ward off evil. Some people got the idea if you got a Bible in your house, you're okay. You put one in your car and drive down the road, it makes you feel all right. Well, I got a Bible. I'm a Christian. I'm on good shape. Well, you could have yourself a hundred Bibles, but until you open it and read it and follow what it says, you're not okay in the eyes of God. We have to put this to use. Use them. Use them up. Get another one. They're not that expensive. Do not be deceived. The Bible can be misused in a way to destroy your soul. Because you could take a good translation and read your thoughts into the Scriptures. That's what homosexuals are doing today. When they talk about David loving Jonathan, it's all oh, that was a homosexual relationship. It was not. Well, wouldn't you like to transport some of them back in time, let them go up to David and say, you and Jonathan homosexuals? He's the man of war. And he knew how to use a sword. You know, it's easy to attribute things to people who can't defend themselves, isn't it? But we want to be exegetes. We want to take God's Word and read His message out to us. Because that's the only safety we have in getting it from here to heaven. Read God's message out. Now, the Bible is from God. The Word of God must be handled with extreme care. An honest student will not accept a perverted translation. I don't see how anyone that says they want to honestly follow God and accept a translation that is perverted. When you can look at the evidence and see that the thing is mistranslated. Men must not change or interpolate it in any way. Now open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, and then in the book of Proverbs, and then in the book of Revelation, God tells us how he wants us to handle his word. For in Deuteronomy it says, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Back there, when Moses penned those words, and God inspired him to write that down, he says, you don't add to it, you don't take away from it. Now, that was the beginning of writing of our Bible. And then, if you look in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 30 and verse 6, do not add to his words, lest, you be, lest, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. And that's in the middle of our Bible. And if we get over here to the end, in Revelation 22 and verse 18 and following, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in his book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take, his, take away his part out of the book of life with, <coughs> from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, God has explicitly said, you do not change his words. Now, the devil is good at changing words, isn't he? And the devil is good at taking God's word out of context. All you have to do is look at Matthew chapter 4, when the Lord was tempted, <coughs> and how the devil could use scriptures in a way to set his own desires. But Jesus knew how to defeat the devil because he knew how to handle the scriptures correctly, didn't he? You know, that pattern is still saying today, as long as we're following this, not adding to or taking away from it, we can defeat the enemy. We can defeat those who are contrary to truth. There are many who are spiritually hungry. This is why so many of the different cults, so many of the different religions are springing up today, and they're being very successful in gathering people. There's things like cowboy churches, 
just wrote an article on a cowboy shirt. Enable someone to saddle up and ride off into the sunset of compromise. A lot of Baptists in our county, and they'll like that. But there are a lot of people that are hungry. And the bad part, they're close to being filled. Back when this country was being explored, some explorers, uh, Lewis and Clark, certainly went exploring. And some explorers were in California, and for six months they starved to death. They were literally starving. And yet there was a river there that was just chuck full of salmon. And they didn't eat. See, the thing is today, a feast is available in the Bible. All we have to do is to divide. If someone is hungry spiritually, you can be filled. Someone wants to be pleasing to God, you can know the way. You want to know you can be saved? All you have to do is follow what it says and you can know. Know the sure. The feast is available. Let's be people of the book and feed upon this great wealth of knowledge from the mind of God. Well, maybe you weren't real certain that he was finished at that point, because usually we hear a bunch of amen. Can we hear some now? Amen. Paul, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Her name was Bertha Wunderlich in the Klein community where I'm from. She was the keeper of the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> 